Hey there, Dango Stu here. Today's video is on finally having the new motor for the green machine. Now, I say new motor, but it's actually a, a new motor, you know, new to me. I was looking to buy a brand new motor because I know I harped on for quite a while about really needing the reliability. So this decision's perhaps slightly uh, contrary to that idea, but it was too good a deal to pass up. New motors uh, in Australia run around about, they all seem to very commonly be about 8,800. And I was about eight and a half grand short. So I figure, you know, you make do. This motor, the storm that the green machine got damaged in, the boat this motor was on sank. So we're starting from a pretty unreliable point, but the motor's 2004, so it's not that old really. So even though 2004 is what, 12 years ago now, so it's 12 years old, it's only done about 300 hours. So that's, that's not too bad. I think mostly it's suffered from corrosion, like all things do, sitting in salt water for 12 years. But internally, I'm expecting it to be pretty sound. So I won't keep you waiting any longer. I'll show you what we got here. So as I said, 2004, it's a 40 horsepower, so a little bit less power than I was hoping, but I think 40 will still be enough. Uh, 40 Honda four stroke. So I'll give you a close look and I'll show you where we're at. So I went and got it yesterday from the mechanic that had taken it off the boat, that it went to when the boat sank and picked it up grabbed a few things. It's in a few pieces. Uh, all the controls and things are lying around. So there's the forward control unit. So I'll be taking that apart and cleaning it out today. I focused a bit on the motor yesterday. Sorry, I didn't get a chance to film that. You can see a few sections like in here have got quite rusty, but that's pretty quick to replace. The cow lower cowling was full of river mud from the bottom of the river from its little trip. So that was pretty bad. So I actually, I, so the first thing I did was take the carburetors off and I went and cleaned those on the bench, done videos on that, it was pretty straightforward. They didn't look too bad. They definitely had water in them, but you know, they were okay. So I took those off. Then I actually um, plugged the inlet manifold with some rags and then gurneyed the whole thing with fresh water. So it was actually quite muddy, the whole motor. And now it's not too bad. So I even actually got right in and need all the electrics and everything. I know it seems pretty extreme, but it came up quite nicely. Then I disconnected all the plugs, put some WD-40 in all the plugs, fuses, the main wiring loom connector, all this kind of thing. So it's much cleaner now. I also uh, drained the sump oil, which wasn't too bad. It was black, it was old, but it didn't seem that emulsified. I've been told this motor has run since it sank, so that's a good thing. Uh, this is now a new oil filter. If you happen to have one of these motors, that's a Z436, which I've put as a substitute for the Honda one that was on there. A bit cheaper, easy to get. Spark plugs are new. Not that they would have suffered much from the sinking, but I figure while I'm here. This is the fuel filter I've taken out. This fuel filter, I believe, is also commonly available at auto stores. So I'm gonna go and grab one of those. And when I get back, I'll tell you what the part number is on that too, in case you're looking to get aftermarket fuel filters for your Honda. Uh, I also had the uh, flywheel cover off before and it turns over quite easily by hand. So it's not even close to C, so I'm not worried about that. I put a grease gum and all the grease nipples. The uh, tilt tube still feels reasonably smooth for its age, even though there's quite a bit of rust up under here. That's probably the weakest link of this whole thing. And unfortunately, it's a very hard part to get to to replace. Yeah, it's, you know, it's an afternoon, but it's not, not straightforward. So I think I'll let that sit for a while. We'll see how long it lasts. So my goal for the day is to open the control unit up, clean that out with some fresh and lubricate it. I'm going to put the control cables on the air compressor and do that technique of using the air compressor to push oil through it to make sure we displace any water and make sure they don't seize up over time. So I'll let those sit while I'm working on other things. Over here's the gearbox somewhere. Gearbox, gearbox, not, not, what a mess. Okay, here we go, sorry. So here's the gearbox for it. The uh, Water pump had been taken apart by the mechanic who looked at it. Um, not sure why, but I'll put that back together. I'll look at the impeller. 
the prop looks pretty new so I'm kind of happy with that and then I'll test all that water pump before I put that back on so the other job for today is to take the starter motor off pull it apart and lubricate that so pull it apart clean it lubricate it get new water out so I don't have a fuel tank for this so I'm going to make up a Honda fuel line connect it to my old petrol tank and then we'll be getting close to firing up and see if it runs so here's the wiring loom too all the plugs for the forward control end actually all look pretty good there's a bit of this sort of green corrosion on the outboard end so I'll get in there with a bit of sandpaper and sort of gently clean that up and then put some more WD-40 on it to try and protect it but other than that the loom seems reasonably serviceable ah here's what's not though that's the taco nice I decided to start this repair by lubricating the waterlog control cables just going to wind these ends off to make it easier to fit into the hose might disassemble them completely actually I'll take the nut off and both the rubber grommets if you do a lot of work with hose clamps these little 8 mil hex flex tools are great for hose clamps much better than screwdriver just a bit of oil down it just going to keep going to the hose is full and pop the air compressor on that was leaking a fair bit here because I think I had it too far down it was around a hex shaped part of the hose so I've moved it up to where it's round hopefully it'll seal better I don't know if you can see on camera there but quite a bit of water came out the other end when I first put the air on so I'm pleased that's out these are the sorts of things you get with sunk boats they'll actually work reasonably well but if you don't go and do these extra jobs it will start failing down the track and my goal here is to actually fix this up well enough that it stays running nicely for a few years to come at least all right that's better it's leaking a little bit ah no it's not it's actually coming out of this end so there we go I don't know if we can see anything yet but that's actually the air coming right through the other end so the plan's very much like the other video I did is just to push that oil right from that hose through the other end then I'm pretty confident these will keep going for a long time you can see down here now I actually got distracted the snap-on truck turned up and uh, well, this oil had made it all the way through you can see a bit of water in a few patches of the oil but I'm pretty comfortable now that that cable yeah moves really moves really freely now so pretty comfortable that cable is going to go the distance. I'll swap the hose over to the other cable and we'll push on. Like the other cable, a bit of water came out straight away. So I'm just going to leave that sitting until the oil comes through from the other end. I'm going to put these carburetors back on now. They're just resting here at the moment and I've got to put the airbox silencer on. They're a little bit fiddly to get back together because all the fuel lines sort of go around the back of them and there's some vacuum lines and things around there too. But fortunately I did manage to get a manual for this pretty easily. So this manual I got from I think readmanuals.com again. I tend to get quite a few there. And I think it was like $26 or something, so pretty good. So it's obviously a PDF version, which you download straight away, which is nice as well. And I just printed off the section for the carburetors. So I'll get those back together. I'm not going to go into that in any huge detail. I just want to try and get this motor started. But I will try and give you an overview of the things I'm doing to this motor to help it sort of recover and from its sinking and hopefully have quite a long life. But I was really happy to know that I could get a service manual for this easily. Definitely ticked one of the big boxes for me when it came to choosing an outboard. 
just a bit of an update on this second cable. I don't know if that oil's uh, aerated or emulsified, but at least it's making it all the way through now. So either way, I'm happy this cable's going to survive as well. So I just stuck down to Auto One to look for one of these fuel filters, and it turns out the one that matches is a. Uh, I got a Cooper one, which was a WZ198, and it seems pretty much an exact match for it. So that's good, and that was ten dollars. Not sure what Honda charged, but at least it was easy to get and it was in stock. It is labelled with an arrow this one, so the inlet is the part with the little crescent here. One thing I do really like about this outboard is I'm not seeing any evidence of previous dodgy fixes. The old Yamaha on the green machine had just been hacked so many times in the past. So it's nice to see that prior to its uh, sinking, this probably had a reasonably good life. New fuel filters in now, so new fuel filter, new oil filter. Now I'm going to start putting these cubs back on. I've now got the carburetors back on and they were a little bit fiddly to be honest. Those vacuum lines behind I sort of managed to get on with some long nose pliers and then as you push the carburetors on they sort of go further down the tubes they're supposed to slot over which is nice. There's a couple of bolts on this uh, air, in, air box. There's the two centre ones closest to the block. You need to get those on before you put the carburetors on because you can't, there's no room to slot them in afterwards. So made that mistake and that's all right now. And then also just this throttle cam linkage has got a couple of springs and a few fiddly bits, but it seems to be working and it looks like it pushes the diaphragm for the accelerator pump and everything. So I think that's going to be all right. Next thing I'm going to do is take the star motor off. So I'll have a look at it. If it looks okay, I'll run with it. If it looks really bad, I might order another one because it's a $300 item to get an aftermarket starter motor, and that is one of those key parts of the reliability. If it doesn't run amazingly, you still get there. If it doesn't start at all, you're in trouble. This starter motor's got a few signs of rust on the Bendix gear, so from the outward view, it's not in great nick. But I'll take it apart and see what's inside. Before I do that though, I'm just gonna get a pen and just mark the casing and the body. just to help with reassembly. These bolts here will go all the way through the starter motor, so it's sort of important to get all these three parts lined up again to get it back together. So having that mark just make things a bit easier down the track. This one's got some eight mil bolts on the end. Just get this little plastic hammer, see if we can knock this apart. That's not looking great. I'm not saying it isn't isn't savable, but I'm not going to. I could spend a couple of hours cleaning that up and maybe having a starter motor that works reliably. Well, given I'm already so far ahead, having saved thousands, I think I'll just put a new aftermarket start motor in this. So I'll go and order one of those, and then I'll push on to putting the gearbox back together. This is the Hitachi motor that was on it, and I found this aftermarket one here. So the critical thing is the nine tooth uh, clockwise, but it says here it covers the BF40, which is this motor, from 95 to 2014. And the Honda number here is pretty close to the Hitachi number. This one, it ends with ZV5-0130, where this is, uh, if that'll focus, probably not, there we go, uh, 0133, so maybe just a superseded one, I'm not sure. But it looks like it's compatible, so I'll order one of those, and then we'll hopefully have that in a couple of days. It's never a good sign when you have to sweep your bench after opening a starter motor. Next thing on the operating table is the forward controls. These are the mounting bolts for putting it onto the boat, so I'll just take these back out. Just 
just a bit of a spacer plate so you don't hit your knuckles. And then the rest of it's Phillips head screws. This bottom cover is where the control cables come into. I'll take it all apart first and then I'll give you a close up inside. But I'm not seeing anything to worry about so far. And just pop this fast idle lever off. looking really good inside here. I'm guessing this unit didn't actually go under. So that's great, very happy about that because obviously a lot more expensive to replace this than it would have been to replace that starter motor. So I'm quite happy for the cheap things to have suffered and the expensive things to have survived. I think we'll call that a win, put it back together. I haven't spoken to the owner about it but I think the reason this survived is because the boat was tied to a pontoon when it sank. So if it was tied up by the starboard side, then as the boat sank, it would have gone down at the stern and then kind of rolled onto its port side. The lines holding it to the pontoon may have actually kept these controls out of the water. So I think we've been lucky there. I'm gonna leave this bottom plate off because I've got to mount the cables before I put it in the boat anyway. So here's the gearbox mounted up in the vise now. The oil seal for this shift linkage looks really crusty. I think this is all just mud on top, so I'm going to take it outside and give it a pressure wash and then bring it back in and we'll see what it looks like underneath. So here's what it looks like cleaned up. Not a huge amount better. But what I think I'm going to do is drain the oil and do a pressure test and then we'll sort of go from there. Having said that, now is a great time to change that oil seal and potentially even this plate because it's a bit corroded. But we'll see what result we get first. Impact screwdrivers are really good for this sort of job where you get things corroded in, screws in. All you need to do is put it in, press, and then preload it in the undo direction. And while you're holding that sort of counterclockwise tension on it, give it a hit with a hammer. Then once it's broken the corrosion, you can just wind it out. You can hit these pretty hard, but because I've got this mounted in a vise by the skeg, I don't want to break the skeg off, so just be careful if you've got this configuration. As always, what this oil looks like will give us a few clues as to the condition of this gearbox. That gearbox oil is, as well as dripping all over my bench. Incredibly clean, so that's a good sign. Happy with that. Nice blue colour too, never seen that before. While that oil's draining, I'm just going to whip the prop off and have a quick check for fishing line and the oil seals there. I may as well consider this a bit of a full service as well as a repair. This is a 22 mil socket for the prop nut, same as it was on the Yamaha. I know you're not supposed to hold props with your hand like that, it's my bad. Yeah. Plenty of fishing line. Mostly caught up around the back of the thrust washer. The oil seals here look very new, so I think we'll just get on and do the pressure test. Both of these screws just have O-rings on them. I'm gonna have a quick look in the manual and see whether they're supposed to be O-rings or supposed to be fibre washers. The manual lists that part as washer, not O-ring. Doesn't say fibre washer, but it certainly doesn't say O-ring, so I think I'm going to swap them for some new fibre washers. Seems to hold pressure, so I'm pretty confident this gearbox not leaking. So I'm going to put some new oil in it, put the fibre washers on the plugs and put it back together. Just going to let that settle for a minute for any air bubbles to come out. Give it one more pump.
just going to sh use the shifter to sort of nip these up literally just like a eighth of a turn or something all right i'm going to give this prop shaft a, a a clean and then put some fresh grease on it and we'll get the prop back on there are ways of putting grease on a prop shaft that feels less awkward than others all right thrust washer prop Spacer, washer nut. I'll go grab a new split pin. Just going to give this base plate a little bit of a clean. Just putting a little bit of rubber grease in the impeller just to make it easier to slide down. And I'll go grab the bolts for the pump housing. Just clean these bolts up a bit, then I'm going to put a little bit of Loctite on each one before I put them in. 10 mil heads on those. So there's a little bit of rubber grease on the inside of the pump housing as well, so the impeller doesn't start up dry. And I'm just going to run these down so they've got an even pressure around the whole housing. A little bit of grease up on the drive shaft splines now, and we'll slide this gearbox back in. It always sounds so easy when you say it that way. Trim tilt motors are a lot more sealed than starter motors, but we're about to find out how the trim fared during the sinking. Oh, well, that's a win. Just putting a touch of grease on each of these bolts before I uh, run them in the gear case. Just to make sure they come out again down the track. These bolts are a 40mm spanner. This camera's about to go flat, so I'll finish running these bolts down, go and have some lunch, and then we'll pick up from there. Back from lunch now. Bolts are up here. I, there's another bolt underneath this trim anode, so that's in. I've also put this anode on in a very central position, so I'm just gonna see if it suffers any real torque steer and then I'll, I'll adjust that as necessary so we'll probably do a video on that. Also put the gearbox in reverse just to bring this collar down a little bit and then wound this up and put the locking nut on so the gear selector is reattached as well. I'll lower this back down again and we'll put some oil in it. According to the manual this outboard takes two litres of 5W30. When I drained the oil, there was no obvious signs of water in the sump oil for this motor. And I had been told that it had been running since it had sunk. Not quite sure how, because there was a bit of water in the carburetors, but I'm assured it has been running. So if there was water, say, in the under the valve cover, all this kind of thing, I think it would have come through into that oil. So I'm pretty comfortable it's going to be okay. But what I am going to do is just run this for a very short time before doing an oil change. So I can just let this oil pick up any impurities, any water, whatever, and then I'll probably just swap the oil filter and put fresh oil in, maybe within a week or so of getting it on the boat, just to be on the safe side. I think, you know, for the sake of $30 of oil and a $10 oil filter, I just think it's worth doing it. So that's, that's my plan in case you're wondering about not stripping the valve cover off and all that kind of stuff. Another little minor problem with this outboard is that the rubber for the cowling has come off. So I'm just going to put a bead of sticker flex around here and stick it on. Oh, 
All right, I'll leave that to set for a little while. Getting close now, I think, to having everything ready to put on the boat. So I'm just going to pop these control cables in. They're just held in with little R-clips. Bring you in a bit closer. Both these cables are the same. There's no difference between a, a throttle and a gear selector cable. So it's just a little washer and an R-clip. Got the second one on top here. These grooves just slot in at this metal. And then I've just got to retract the cable till it matches. There's also just a little separator that goes between the cables. So the bottom one slots in. Then the little separator slots in. Then the top cable. And then our two screws. The last thing I think I need to do is rig up some sort of fuel line. So I'm just going to make up a temporary line. Just going to have uh, a bit of fuel line, a primer bulb, then a bit more fuel line going to a Honda fitting. The fuel tank itself, which was here somewhere. Ah, there it is right in front of me, <laughs> going blind. I, uh, this just has a, a barb fitting on it. So a bit of hose, pump, and then to the motor. The reason I say this is a temporary setup is simply that although I'll be using this tank and I'll be using this hose and, and bulb and everything, I do want to put a water separating fuel filter in line. So once the boat's back in the workshop, I'll sort of upgrade that fuel system slightly. But for now, I think I'll just have about a metre of line. One day I'll actually buy one of those nice little cutters that does square cuts in hose. I'm not going to put a huge amount of line here because this is the one that's going to go from the tank to the fuel filter down the track. Although having said that, it is nice to be able to move the fuel line around, so I'll give it a, maybe even a couple of meters. So a short bit of hose is going onto the tank. This is all eight mil fuel line, eight mil internal diameter. And then the final piece of the puzzle is the Honda fuel fitting. All right, I'll throw this on the car tonight and go and fill it up with some clean unleaded. And fingers crossed that starter motor turns up. The replacement starter motor's arrived now, so we'll open this up. Pop it in and then see if it starts. Here it is, another shiny one from Oswide Starters. This starter motor is held on by three bolts, two with a 12 mil head and one with a 10 mil head. So I'm just gonna put a little bit of Loctite on these. And then the 10 mil heads, the one on the bottom. Then the earth strap. <coughs> Once again, a little bit of Loctite on the thread and then just a little bolt for the 
earth strap up here. And then the positive lead from the relay down here is a 12 mil. I'm just going to go and grab the forward controls because I'm going to need to hook them up so we can get the ignition on and crank it, etc. And the fuel tank and a battery. So we'll be back. Turn the tap on and we'll see what happens. Well, I've got to say, I'm pretty stoked about that. That was literally the first time I'd turned the key in anger with fuel on. I'd turned it for two seconds before with no fuel just to make sure it was starting, like, you know, the starter mode's engaging. And that really is the first time this thing's fired up, the first time I tried to fire it up. So I'm really happy with that. I did notice, however, it wasn't, uh, no water was coming out the telltale. So I'll uh, have a look what's going on there. I had the impeller off and it looked fine, so I don't think it's an issue there. It may have just got blocked up in mud or whatever when it was um, when it was sunk. So I'll just start blowing some compressed air through the hoses and we'll see if, if that clears it up. Once I get the telltale working, I'm going to run it a little bit longer. Then I'll just switch it off, let it settle for a little while, let the oil drain back down into the sump and I'll check the oil level, just make sure that's right. Because it listed two litres of oil, but it wasn't clear whether that was with or without an oil filter change, so I'll just, just double check and make sure that level's right. I don't know if I ever told you how much I paid for this motor, but I got it for $200, so very cheap. Um, obviously the whole sort of unknown, it's sunk thing saves you a lot of money, it's a gamble, but to be honest with you, I'm really happy with this now. I feel like this is actually gonna go pretty well for a few years. In case you're really wondering, as some of you may be, after that whole deliberation about buying a new motor, which was 100% genuine, there was no doubt that was what I was aiming to do originally until this came along and in case you're wondering I had actually decided to buy the Tahatsu 50 um, so there you go at least you know what I was meaning to do um, but shortly after I started arranging finance and everything to make that happen this came along so that sort of put that on the back burner but that actually was my choice so there's two upsides about buying this motor one is obviously it saved me a lot of money which I didn't have the other is that I think it's going to give us a lot more videos. Having a brand new motor that works perfectly has limited scope for videos. This is an older carburetor one, so I can finally get around, and the screw's working, so I can finally get around to doing a bit of a carburetor tuning video. I've been looking forward to that for a while, so we'll definitely be doing that on this motor. I'll leave this video here. I'll do a second video on mounting this motor back onto the green machine, but I'm really happy now that this is going to be, be a, a going concern, a good option to put on the boat. So next thing I think I'll do is get back into some more wiring and then next time Paul's in the shop, we'll throw this on the, on the boat. So take care, thanks for watching. Uh, if you enjoyed, please rate, comment and subscribe and I'll catch you next time, see ya.